AstraZeneca, they beat the street with second quarter profits as the loss of COVID-19 vaccine sales is offset by its cancer and diabetes drugs. It stood by its outlook as adjusted profit jumped 25% to $2.15 per share. AstraZeneca also upped its guidance on China, its biggest market, saying that it expected total revenue to grow by a low to mid single digit percentage in 2023. Also announcing a big deal, its unit Alexion buying Pfizer's early stage rare disease gene therapy portfolio for up to $1 billion. Joining us now, we've got AstraZeneca CFO Aradana Sarin and we've got Yahoo Finance's health reporter Anjali Kemlani. Thank you so much for joining us here this morning and we appreciate the time. You know, just kind of looking back on this most recent quarter and then even through to some of the forecasts, what are some of the major catalysts that you believe AstraZeneca is able to take advantage of is riding right now? You know, AstraZeneca's story is really all about innovation. And uh, what you see this quarter is really a reflection of all the investments we've made in innovation and new products over the decade. Um, what you saw uh, in this quarter's results, so revenue growth obviously was very strong if you exclude uh, COVID revenue. So on a like for like basis, it was 17% growth in the quarter, but it was really quite evenly distributed. Um, oncology grew 25%. Cardiovascular, renal, metabolic grew uh, 18%, respiratory and immunology grew 14%, and rare diseases grew 10%. So really across the board, and it's the same when you look at uh, geography. So the U.S. grew 10%, very strong growth in emerging markets. And uh, it really speaks to the strength of the medicines that we have, uh, very strong, innovative medicines, growth driven by Tegriso, by uh, Farsiga, which, uh, again, is uh, is our largest medicine this quarter, uh, but also drugs like Inher2 and Calquence and Ultimaris. Um, so really a very broad portfolio uh, that we're very excited about. Aradhana Anjali here. I want to talk to you about the uh, the Pfizer deal right now. That seems to be a, a trend sort of broadly in the industry, looking at shifting portfolios to really streamline and focus, you know, narrowly on certain areas. Tell me how this fits into the broader goal for AstraZeneca. Sure. So uh, what this transaction is, is essentially uh, some of the early stage technology. So all the, the stuff that we're acquiring is preclinical. And it consists of a gene therapy modality. So what we're acquiring are certain capsids and uh, gene constructs that are highly focused towards rare diseases. So give, to give you a little bit of context, there are about 7,000 rare diseases in the world. And rare diseases being defined as those which have 20, 200,000 or less in terms of patients. About 80% of those diseases are actually genetic based, and many of them are pediatric uh, in, in nature because they are uh, have a genetic foundation. And so the benefit and the value that gene therapy can bring potentially is that you could have a curative uh, product for many of these genetic conditions. Now, these products and, and technology, really, it's a technology acquisition, is very early right now. Um, it's going to take another, you know, several years of investments before we we start to see the uh, the benefit that these drugs could bring. Um, but again, it's, uh, you know, very much in line with the innovation theme and that AstraZeneca continuously invests in new innovation and new technologies. And we think gene therapy, uh, cell therapy, and several other such uh, technologies will be technologies of the future, and that's why we're investing in it. Aradhana, it's Julie here. Um, as I look through the results, which, as you said, look back at the results, what you're talking about is sort of in the future and trying to target future revenue and profits. Last quarter was strong, and I have seen some analyst questions about why you didn't raise your full year forecast as a result. Can you explain to us and, and what you perhaps expect in the second half of the year? Yeah, so we reiterated our guidance for the full year, um, and some of it is is phasing. And you know, because we have such a broad portfolio, there are some products that are going to decline uh, in the second half. And not surprisingly, for example, Simbacort is a product that is going generic in the U.S., and and we expect to have generic competition in the second half of the year. Uh, similarly, Nexium is a product, a very old product that uh, went generic in Japan. So there are some of these older legacy products that um, have gone generic and will, you know, will start to see that generic impact more 
in the second half. Um, we also didn't raise guidance because uh, some of our cost lines, so our SGNA and R&D is more weighted towards the second half uh, as it was uh, last year as well. Uh, but this year in particular, you know, we, we mentioned in the beginning of the year that we're aiming for close to 30 phase three study starts. And most of those phase three study starts will actually be towards the second half of the year. Um, and again, that will obviously be meaning means that uh, our cost will be higher and, and therefore uh, the impact on, on EPS. So uh, net net, I think we're very much on track for the full year, but there are some dynamics between the first and the second half. There's been a lot of deal making, but a lot of also eyeing kind of spinoffs, separations across your industry Industry. And particularly AstraZeneca ha has been the central point uh, of one of the most recent developments, especially within China, where we know that there have been several businesses that have either been targeted or have separated their business into different entities. Is that something that's still on the docket for AstraZeneca? And if so, what type of timeline would you be looking at? Yeah, so uh, I know you're referring to uh, some of the articles and rumors that came out uh, relating to China. I mean, China is a very strong business for us. It's a uh, you know, six billion uh, business. And uh, it is, we are the largest pharmaceutical company in China. Um, and, you know, do we evaluate different things from time to time? You know, we're constantly evaluating all sorts of ideas, but, you know, 90% of those ideas don't uh, don't see the light of day. Um, so all I'd say is, you know, we, we don't comment on rumors. We are very committed to our business in China, but more importantly, we're also committed to innovation in China. And you've seen um, ourselves as well as uh, many of our peers do um, licensing deals with biotech companies in China that are coming out with uh, new innovation. And we think there is a really an opportunity to accelerate our innovation uh, in China. Arana, I'm so glad you talked about the licensing part because my question was going to be on the biotech scene there. It seems to, like there's a lot of interest, especially, uh, you know, sort of post pandemic, if you will, on what is actually going on in the ground. What can you tell us about why it's such a strong market and whether or not you're looking at maybe targets there, you know, as a result, maybe some M&A activity? Um, so it's, it is really fascinating because um, over the last two, three years, both in the biotech market, uh, broadly speaking, I think there was a lot of interest during the pandemic and a lot of investors invested in the biotech sector. Um, but what we also see is it was not just U.S. biotech, but also a significant growth in the biotech sector in China. Now, all the companies obviously will will not be successful, and you know many times in in early stages there are um, many companies chasing the same target or chasing the same technology. So, it's really being the you know what we think we can bring is the ability to sort of pick the right targets and pick the right opportunities. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for licensing both uh, in the U.S. and and with uh, U.S. biotech, but also with uh, China biotech. And I also want to ask, um, delving specifically into one experimental drug that you have um, to treat lung cancer. I'm not going to attempt the pronunciation, but um, I know that the, the stock went down recently when you all released some early results from, tr from, uh, from uh, trials of that. Can you give an update? I know that your CEO has talked about that investors eventually are going to be pleased with the results, but how should people be thinking about the timeline and the eventual success, hopefully for you, of, of that drug? Yeah, so I think the drug you're referring to uh, in short form, it's called uh, DATO DXD. And the uh, trial that we announced high level results on um, was called the Cropian Lungo 1 study. So this drug is uh, actually a very innovative drug. It's an antibody drug conjugate. Um, and what it attempts to do is deliver very targeted, you know, in simplified terms, very targeted uh, chemotherapy to, uh, to patients. Uh, we're testing this drug in lung cancer, but also in breast cancers and, and other cancers. Um, as is normally our practice, and actually practice in, in most of the pharma industry, uh, when we announce results, we actually only announce very high level results because uh, the results are actually embargoed and the study is blinded uh, till we present it at a medical conference. And we will uh, do that later in the year. So we can't share all the data 
around that. Um, but the study was a positive study. We're very excited about it. Uh, this study in particular was for a second line lung cancer patients. So patients have already failed uh, who were you know, in later lines, but have already failed uh, their, their first line um, therapies. And uh, we're very uh, excited by the results. And subsequently, we've also had some discussions uh, with the FDA, and we intend on uh, filing the study for approval. Uh, eventually, we think this drug will have applications beyond lung cancer as well. And uh, we're waiting to see how those studies result. Certainly looks like a potential blockbuster in the pipeline. Uh, and finally, I know that I know that you're not the chief, you know, uh, lobbyist there, but I want to talk a little bit about the pharma uh, 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 departure. Um, what is it that you're looking at in terms of cost effectiveness for lobbying? Where is it that you see the potential, and where are you reallocating if not part of this trade group? Um, so I won't comment necessarily on on how we're investing, um, but you know I think there are certain elements of the pharma industry that I think benefit uh, patients overall, and and that's really what we're focused on. I think when uh, companies come together uh, and uh, bring and and hope to bring legislative change, it has to be sort of for the greater good, and in our case specifically for patients and. I think when the the things that we would like to see are things that support innovation, um, things that allow for a diversity in clinical trials, things that allow for resilience and, and building resilience in healthcare systems. And those are the places where we are cooperating and, and working together with uh, both academia as well as with governments uh, on, on those types of things. Aradana, thank you so much. Aradana Sarin, AstraZeneca CFO, thank you so much for your time this morning. And our Anjali Kamlani as well, of course. Thank you.